Libby is the most beautiful of my wife's many friends. She is slightly above average height, with a curvaceous figure, a sweet, beautiful face, green eyes, and shoulder-length hair, the color of which, depending on the lighting, varies from light red to blonde. She has a soft femininity that attracts the old-fashioned gentleman in every man's soul. I defy anyone, male or female, not to find her and her rather shy personality very attractive. Her charm is even stronger due to the fact that, in addition to this cuteness, there is a clear but restrained sexuality in her, an aura of fertility that is entirely unintentional but no less powerful because of it, a silent promise of warm, deeply satisfying physical pleasure for the lucky few who get to experience it. She fulfills this promise to the fullest. I know this better than many because, with full knowledge and with the consent of her husband, I have been Libby's lover for the last three years. My wife Jane and I first met Libby and her longtime partner James over 20 years ago. It was at an Independence Day party hosted by our American friends, whom we met through the junior school our children attended. As friends of friends, we got along well in a relaxed, casual manner and over the ensuing years got to know each other better, attending many of the social events that come with growing children. Although they lived together for many years and had two schoolchildren, Libby and James were not married. I knew from my wife that Libby was not happy with this. She came from a rural farming family where marriage was expected, and she pointedly used her maiden name, as if to make it clear that the lack of commitment came from her partner, not from herself. Why James refuses to take this final step towards marriage remains unclear. A rebel by nature and origin, he is still attractive and can charm most of our friends, men and women. James played in a band in the past and still does, and is rumored to have been quite wild in his youth, until he was stopped by the discovery of a genetic heart defect. Indeed, there were rumors that he was still in a long-term relationship with another woman somewhere nearby, but despite everything that had happened, I was never close enough to him to find out the truth. Jane and I usually met at parties and events organized by our mutual friends, rather than being close friends in our own right. We got along well when we were dating, and it was always a joy to chat with Libby, even if only briefly. Let me say right now that before my affair with Libby, I was faithful to my wife Jane throughout our marriage. I'm a pretty nice guy and have always had an easy time with women, so I've had many opportunities to cheat over the years, but I've never taken advantage of any of them. Jane is a wonderful person. She's average height, has a fuller figure than she would like, and a sweet face, but the truth is that she never liked sex and spent most of our marriage trying to avoid it. Except for the early years of our relationship, she was never adventurous in bed and always expected me to do all the work. With the advent of children, her interest in sex waned even more, and when the hormonal pause began, her desire collapsed, and our sex became less and less frequent, until over the last ten years the number of times per year could be counted on one hand, and even this was very formal, without any real participation on her part. Out of necessity, my own desire lessened somewhat over time, but like most married couples, there was still a significant difference. I don't offer this as an excuse for what happened. However, before the events of this story, I had no intention of finding any other sexual outlet other than those that could be enjoyed in privacy and on the Internet. This is what I quietly enjoy, as is clear from my telling this story to Jenny. I guess for me the story begins with dinner at James and Libby's. It was a Saturday evening, and we were two of six guests. Although Jane had been to Libby's house many times, this was my first visit, so we were both pleasantly surprised by the invitation. The evening went well. To my delight, I was seated between Libby and Katie, a tall, slender friend of my wife from the same social circle to which Jane and I were peripheral. Jane herself was seated between our host James and Katie's husband. I was pleased that they would keep her entertained all evening. The food was great. Libby was known to be a good cook, and was so well organized that she was only away from me occasionally. This was not a problem for me, I enjoyed the conversation with both my companions, but of course I paid more attention to our hostess when she was nearby. I must say that I really enjoyed the evening. 
Both Kathy and Libby were smart, interesting people, as well as attractive, although I must admit that I paid more attention to the plump, beautiful, golden figure to my right. I glanced over from time to time to make sure Jane wasn't bored or neglected by the two men on either side of her, but she looked happy and in her place all evening. When we left, we shook hands or kissed our hosts goodbye as usual. Libby offered her cheek quite normally, but when her husband took my hand, he leaned in a little and said quietly, Can I call you next week? I have an idea that might interest you. Of course, I replied. I'm free on Monday and Tuesday afternoons, if one of those times works for you. It seemed to me that there was a strange, almost painful expression on his face. Libby must have thought so too, because she watched him closely as he spoke to me. The rest of the weekend went as usual, home and family matters. By Monday afternoon, I had almost forgotten James's words, so I was surprised when my phone rang with an unknown number around three o'clock. Hi, this is Mike, I replied. Mike, this is James. Can you talk? James? Oh, James, I answered, quickly remembering his words. How are you? How's Libby? We really enjoyed dinner on Saturday. Thank you very much. It was our pleasure. I mean it. It was great to have you two over. It was especially nice to see you for the first time. We chatted a bit about minor things, and then James steered the conversation towards the main reason for his call. From the change in the tone of his voice, I realized that he had moved on to a more serious topic. Remember when I told you I had an offer for you? Yes, I answered. An idea, you said, I'm guessing a business idea. As an investor, I often received requests from friends to evaluate opportunities that were offered to them. I have never invested in friends' businesses. This leads to mutual dissatisfaction, but I was always ready to offer my point of view. Actually, no, James said. It's not about business. It's more personal. I leaned back in my chair. Tell me. He paused, as if trying to figure out where to start. This is a rather unusual idea, he finally began, and I hope I can trust you to keep this a secret. Of course, I replied, intrigued. This is not easy to talk about, he began slowly and hesitantly, as if he were about to say something awkward. But you know about my heart problems, right? He laughed self-deprecatingly. Everyone knows about my heart problems. I've talked about it enough. I, of course, knew and spoke about it with the appropriate level of concern and empathy. Well, I've been on strong medication for years, and I was just told I'll probably be on it for the rest of my life. I'm really sorry to hear that, I answered sincerely. It's okay, he chuckled. The drugs are working, and I'm still alive and well. The problem is that these drugs have some serious side effects. He spoke slowly and meaningfully, as if leading up to something important. One of these side effects is that I suffer from. I can't have sex. I'm really sorry to hear that, I frowned, wondering why he was telling me this intimate fact. The truth is, I haven't been able to do this for over three years now. It looks like I'll be on these medications for the rest of my life, and never be able to do it again. Libby and I haven't had a normal sex life since then, and it's starting to affect our marriage. I, I don't know what to say, I told him honestly and inadequately. You don't have to say anything. Just listen to me. It's not easy for me to say this. I could imagine, but I still didn't understand why he wanted to tell me this now. She would hate it if she knew I was telling you this, but Libby has a very high desire for sex. I laughed. Maybe Jane will come stay with her for a while. Maybe something will be passed on. He laughed too, but muffled. It's not as big a bonus as you might think, he said. If a woman needs sex and her man can't give it to her, their marriage is at risk. And Libby hasn't been satisfied for years. I raised an eyebrow in silence. There was a long pause. She and I have discussed this many times, he continued. She assures me it's not a big deal, but we both know it's a big deal. We've tried every possible way to help. Nothing has worked. Either the drugs conflict with my heart medications, or they just don't work. He paused, 
as if recounting all this was traumatic for him, and no doubt it was. It couldn't be easy for a husband to tell another man that he couldn't make love to his wife, but why he felt the need to tell me was still a mystery. With Libby's desire so high and my feelings of inadequacy, the tension between us became unbearable. We were both constantly frustrated, and this led to serious fights. They usually started over something minor, but we both knew what the real reason was. I'm so sorry, James, I sympathized. I wasn't sure how my own marriage could handle a complete and constant lack of sex. Jane would probably be delighted, but how would I cope? But he's not done yet. Anyway, when we found out that surgery wasn't possible and that I would be on strong medication all the time, we decided the stress was too much for us. It wasn't fair to force Libby to abstain from sex for the rest of her life because of my condition. It puts our, the relationship is in serious jeopardy. I could imagine it, but I still didn't understand where it was going. We discussed this many times and explored all possible alternatives before coming to a conclusion. I expected him to say that they were going to break up, but apparently that was not his plan. You and I have known each other for a long time, he continued, as if changing the subject. It was true, we didn't know each other well, but we had certainly been casual friends for at least two decades. You've always liked me, and I think I like you too, so I'm asking if I can trust what I am going to tell you, keeping it a secret. Of course you can, I replied, surprised. He took a deep breath before delivering the devastating news. We decided that, for the sake of our marriage, Libby needed real male help. She needed someone in her life who could give her the physical aspects of marriage that I could no longer provide. I was stunned. Did my friend actually tell me that he agreed for his wife to have sex with someone else? That's true, he confirmed in a trembling voice. I know it sounds strange, but we decided that Libby needs a lover. I must have looked shocked because he immediately continued. Lover, Mike. Friend with benefits, sex partner. Damn it, James. We were thinking about using the services, he continued. We even tried it once, but Libby didn't like having sex with a stranger, even if it was physically pleasurable, and paying for it later made her feel dirty. My jaw dropped at this news. Did our friends pay for sex? But James wasn't done yet. Libby is an old-fashioned girl. In her book, sex and affection are two sides of the same coin. If it's going to work for her, she needs to do it with someone she knows and has feelings for. Someone she's with can connect, with someone she finds attractive and who she knows feels the same about her. First of all, she needs someone we both know and trust. There was a long pause. We'd like that person to be you. You could knock me down with a feather. You mean you want me to? We want you to become Libby's regular and completely hidden lover, Mike. I... Uh, don't know what to say. I know this sounds weird, but I'm serious. We are serious. To avoid any misunderstandings, we want you to come here every time Libby needs you and have sex with her. Can I be clearer? He couldn't, and despite the shock, I finally understood what was being asked, although I still didn't believe it. But what about Jane? I asked. I'm married and... Jane doesn't have to know. James replied seriously. It's not like Libby and I want to make our problem public, is it? We're both good at keeping secrets. We've hidden my problems long enough, haven't we? It was indeed true, I thought for a moment. Why me? I mean, I'm very flattered and amazed, but I don't understand why you want it to be me. James paused before answering. To be honest, the decision wasn't that hard not compared to the decision that she should have a lover at all. Libby needs to find a man attractive, but also get along well with him. You fit the bill on both counts. Libby was always a little like you, and we always knew you had some attraction to her, so that checked most of the boxes. Was it really that obvious that I liked Libby? For a moment I wondered who else had noticed, but James continued. It couldn't be a close friend, not someone we see often, it would be too awkward for all of us if we were always at the same social events. There would be sexual tension between you. Sooner or later, someone then he will notice. You know what kind of women we have. 
Of course I knew. At least two of my wife's close friends enjoyed scandals, real or imagined. You come here too. We know you too and love you both, but we're not always at each other's houses. Libby and Jane are in the same book club, I noted with concern. That's true, but neither you nor I go there. It's not like you and Libby run into each other often and have to pretend nothing is happening. This makes sense if you don't consider the improbability of the whole idea. You invited us to dinner, I said, still trying to comprehend the magnitude of my friend's proposal. That was the last test, he chuckled. Dinner last weekend was a final test to make sure she was happy. You two got along well, she flirted. You flirted back. There was a real spark between you and she was happy. We agreed that I should call you this week and, well, asking you to help us. There was another pause before he spoke again. So, Mike, are you ready to come here and have sex with my wife on a regular basis? Not surprisingly, this question dominated my thoughts for the next few days. The whole idea was wrong on many fronts. In addition to being asked to cuckold my friend, James was also asking me to cheat on my wife for the first time in our entire marriage. Unsuspecting Jane went about her life as usual, which meant no sex of any kind. I had almost given up trying, but in an attempt to ease my conscience, I made a series of attempts to initiate intimacy, ranging from subtle hints to outright demands. All of them were politely but firmly rejected. Sex with my wife remained out of reach for me for the foreseeable future. After a week of failure after failure, I finally decided that enough was enough, so I picked up the phone and dialed a familiar number. James' phone. Hi. This is Mike. Yes, Mike? There was tension in the pause that followed before I took a deep breath and told him my decision. If you're really sure that this is what you both want, and you promise Jane won't find out about it, then fine. I agree. You are sure, Jane said sarcastically, and then seemed to change his mind and added, Sorry, I'm bitter. It's okay, I replied. I can't imagine how difficult this must be for you. I really appreciate it. I know it's a strange request for a friend. And don't worry about Jane. We don't want our little arrangement to get out as much as you do. So what's next? I asked uncertain what to do now that this incredible agreement has been reached. I'll talk to Libby and then either call you or text you when she wants to see you. You have to delete the message right after. Remember that. Yes, sure. And let's be clear. This is only about sex, which she wants and I can't provide. I'm still capable of other types of sex. I'm sure it is, I began. I'm not stupid enough to think other things won't happen. You're both human, but the object of the game is sex, okay? I was shocked by James' harsh, angry words, but tried to imagine how I would feel in the same situation, asking another man to provide my wife with sex that I could no longer provide. And be careful not to fall in love. We don't want it to ruin our relationship. Okay, okay, I said, still trying to figure out what I had to do. I'm serious, Mike. She's a wonderful, wonderful girl, and if you're not careful, you'll fall hard for her. I've already seen the possibility of this. Libby gets under your skin, he continued, and I have to know. I guarantee you'll fall in love with her a little. The plan won't work without a little love on both sides. But it has to be under control. I don't want any of our relationships to be damaged. I'll be careful, I said automatically. She'll fall in love with you too, he continued. It's inevitable, but I know how to deal with it. Fine. And remember, your sex with Libby is supposed to save our marriage, not destroy yours. It was about 9.30 the following Monday morning, so long after my conversation with James that I began to doubt whether the whole story was some strange joke. I was sitting at my desk talking on the phone with a client when my cell phone beeped and a preview message appeared on the screen. James Mobile. Tomorrow afternoon at 14 Point Zuzan at our house. She will be alone. Can you come? I quickly ended the conversation with the client, hoping he wouldn't be offended, then stared at the message in amazement. My heart was pounding wildly in my chest. This will really happen. My hand shook as I typed a short answer. 
I'll be there, and then, as if by inertia, thank you. There was no answer. I leaned back in my chair and looked out the window, thinking about what had just happened. Did I really agree to cheat on my wife for the first time and have sex with one of her friends with her husband's full consent? To my amazement, the answer was a resounding yes. It was almost impossible to behave normally this evening when everything at home went on as usual, as if the world had not changed. It was so difficult to carry on a conversation with my wife about curtains when the next day promised such an emotional shake-up, if I can find the courage to see it through. Eventually, I was forced to go for a long, slow jog until the evening's main television program began and conversation became unnecessary rather than necessary. A few words were said as Jane and I went to bed afterwards, both of us apparently engrossed in our books, although in my case I could only skim the same half-page dozens of times before turning off the light. No wonder I didn't sleep well. My head was filled with conflicting emotions. From the upcoming sex with a very attractive, ready woman, I struggled with the confidence that I should not even think about cheating on my wife. The struggle inside me continued almost all night. Sometimes I'd decide to text James in the morning and tell him I'd changed my mind, that no matter how attractive it may be, my wife and family should come first. At other times, the base, earthly side of my nature took over, filling my head with vivid images of what sex with Libby might be like. I lay awake, exhausted, until the small hours came before falling into a brief, unsatisfying slumber. I woke up, unrested, an hour earlier than usual, and, after making endless cups of coffee, I went to work long before Jane began to wake up, guilt preventing me from seeing her sweet face at breakfast. When I parked in the office parking lot, my head still hadn't come to a solution to the dilemma. The morning at work was also a waste, my concentration was so ruined that I sent the same message to three different people twice. Several times I picked up the phone to text James and refuse, but each time my good intentions were overcome by more powerful, baser impulses. If I was mentally stronger, I could have fought these feelings harder, but I am who I am, and when 1.15 came, I signed up for the rest of the day for field visits, climbed into my car, and began a half-hour cross-country drive to village, where my future mistress was supposed to wait. The wrought iron gates were open when I arrived. I drove through them and carefully stopped the car on the gravel road before turning off the engine. My heart pounded even louder and my pulse quickened as I sat and looked at the familiar house in front of me, James and Libby's house. A few minutes later it became even louder as I stood on an elevated porch and rang the bell. The door opened slowly and hesitantly and Libby appeared in the hallway. I don't know what I expected to see, but I was dumbfounded. My wife's friend, whom I've been dating for over 20 years, looked absolutely stunning in a simple pale green summer dress that perfectly hugged the lines of her feminine figure. Her hair was loose and shining with health. Her makeup, never heavy, was applied even more carefully than usual, emphasizing the pale green of her eyes and the fullness of her lips. She looked more beautiful than I had ever seen her before, more sweet than sexy, but the effect had a profound effect on me. Hi, I muttered, confused by her appearance. Hello, she answered quietly, opening the door wide and letting me inside. When Libby closed the door behind me, my stomach was full of butterflies. I had a message from James, I began, trying to sound casual in case there was any misunderstanding. Actually, it was from me. Libby smiled shyly. James lent me his phone. This brought significant relief. About, okay, was all I could say, and then it followed. I really enjoyed the last dinner. The meal was excellent. I'm glad you liked it, Libby replied, leading me into the kitchen where an open bottle of Chilean Sauvignon Blanc and glasses were waiting for me. Would you like a drink? She asked with an awkward smile. I think I need to, I told her honestly, and then quickly added, I'm a little out of my comfort zone. Libby grinned wryly. Me too. As she poured, her hand trembled so much that the neck of the bottle kept hitting the edge of the glass. I took mine from her hand and raised it. To your health, I suggested. To your health, came the answer as our glasses clinked. I took a long sip, 
but to my surprise, Libby drank half the glass in one gulp. I took the hint and compared it drop by drop. Dutch courage. I suggested, taking her trembling fingers in mine. I'm nervous too, I smiled. And don't worry. If you're not ready now, then we don't need to do anything. We're friends first, aren't we? She looked at me, still unable to make the eye contact that had been so prominent during the dinner party. I think. She began, but faltered. Do not rush. She took a deep breath and looked at me again. This time our eyes met. It has to be today, she said decisively. I have to get through this. I've been close to it and backtracked so many times that if it doesn't happen today, I don't think it ever will. And you want this to happen? I asked, and neither of us dared to voice what it really was. She nodded decisively. I really want this. It's just been building up for so long. There was a short pause as I looked at the woman whose body I had come specifically to have sex with, with or without love. Her upturned face, framed by long red blonde hair, looked so young, innocent, and vulnerable that it was hard to believe that she was both a partner and a mother of two grown children. My heart ached for her. How long ago was it? I asked quietly. Since we had real sex? I nodded. Almost three years. I was truly stunned. Three years? This time it was Libby's turn to nod. I told you it was a long time ago. James wanted to ask you for a long time, but I chickened out. I'm glad you changed your mind, I smiled and received a shy grin in response. I, I've never done anything like this before, I continued hesitantly. I'm not sure. How does everything work? Libby looked relieved. Me too, she replied. It seems a little insensitive to just continue doing this without talking first, but, but, but I think I need to do this quickly before I chicken out again. Do you mind, Mike? Was I against it? Wouldn't I mind having sex with my wife's most beautiful friend? Whatever, to make you feel most comfortable, I replied, and my heart began to pound. It feels like I'm treating you like, like, like a call boy, I offered. Libby looked at me in fear. James told me you tried using one, but it didn't work for you, I said, trying to calm her down. Don't worry. Whatever you need is fine with me. She smiled. Maybe we can go upstairs now. Libby led them up the wide dark wood stairs to the landing. All the doors were closed except one, which led to the bathroom. I, I put a clean towel next to the shower for you, she said quietly, stopping us in front of the first open door. What? Oh, of course, I smiled. Should I come in now? Libby smiled shyly. I think you better before I chicken out again. Are you going to be okay while I'm gone? I grinned. I, I'll find something to do. I closed the bathroom door behind me. The room was large, clean and bright, its walls lined with mirrors that gave me a not-so-flattering view of my middle-aged body as I undressed and went into the shower. There was a new bottle of unscented shower gel, which I carefully lathered under running hot water. The feeling of unreality still permeated everything that was happening. I dried myself thoroughly and then wrapped a clean white towel around my waist, pressing my belly as discreetly as I could. With my tight stomach full of butterflies, I opened the door and walked out onto the carpet. There was no one in sight. I looked left and right then, seeing an open door at the end of the corridor, I padded silently and walked into the room beyond. It was a bedroom. The guest bedroom, judging by the sparse furniture, is still large and warm. The curtains were already drawn, and a short, thick candle was burning on either side of the large double bed, with the duvet already unfastened. Hello. A nervous female voice came very close to me. I turned around and gasped. Libby stood in front of me in her panties and bra, white and lacy and obviously new. She looked awkward and shy unable to look me in the eyes when I first looked at her beautiful figure. Trying my best not to look at me, I ran my gaze over the soft, the round body of the girl I was asked to have sex with, from her cute face to her smooth, broad shoulders, full breasts. Her lightly tanned skin contrasted with the bright white lace of her lingerie. It was a beautiful, feminine body, 
full, fertile, and much more attractive than she herself believed. Libby, you're a beautiful girl, I whispered. I'm a middle-aged mother, she answered softly, her eyes looking at my body and not my face. And very beautiful. Can I kiss you? She froze for a moment. I, I don't know. Perhaps it's better not to, she answered hesitantly. Then can I hug you? In response, she moved a little closer. She was tense. I was nervous. Everything is fine. After a second, she nodded. We had sex. Over time, I noticed that Libby was still biting her lower lip. Everything is fine, I whispered, looking at her sweet face. She nodded. I forgot how good it feels. It was amazing, I told her truthfully. Do you feel different? I whispered into Libby's strawberry blonde hair as we lay there half an hour later. Aha, he snorts. Now that it actually happened, I smiled. Was this what you wanted? She snuggled closer to me. It was wonderful, she smiled. Next time I will expect something great. I stopped and a warm feeling came over me. Do you want there to be a next time? I asked quietly. If so, she answered, suddenly uncertain. Right now, more than anything else I can imagine, I told her honestly. I kissed her. I chuckled. There was a long silence. My mind wandered over everything that had happened, still unable to comprehend it all. This actually happened. I really had just had sex with my wife's most beautiful friend. It was undeniable now. Her husband actually asked me to do this too. Her husband. When will James be back? I asked. Not until half an hour later. When should you be home? I shouldn't. I said I work late, I chuckled. Fresh from my shower and feeling better than I had in years, I opened the front door of our house, walked in and joined my unsuspecting wife in the kitchen. I avoided kissing her in case my mouth still smelled, then went upstairs to change into jeans and brush my teeth thoroughly. Of course, I was distant and distracted all evening, but Jane was so absorbed in her books and newspapers that she didn't seem to notice. For the first time in my entire life, I was glad she didn't suggest sex when we went to bed. I lay awake for a long time, listening to the familiar sounds of my wife sleeping next to me, but my head was full of very unfamiliar thoughts. For the first time in our marriage, I cheated on her. I became an unfaithful husband, but to my surprise and shame, this thought felt more like a simple statement of fact rather than a source of guilt. Soon, in the darkness, vivid memories of sexual encounters before my marriage to Jane began to emerge. But of course, the most vivid images of that night were of Libby. Almost three years have passed since that wonderful summer. Libby and I meet every two to three weeks, always at her request. Well, usually, sometimes the impulse comes from me if I feel very deprived in bed. Sometimes it's just an hour of quick sex, sometimes we can spend the whole day together. We have never used any protection, and I hope we never will. During this time, we got to know each other's bodies well. Of course, James was right. I fell in love with Libby. I couldn't stop it. Truth be told, I probably fell in love with her the very first day I looked into her big green eyes. Even then, I knew that everything that happened was more than just sex. She literally became a different woman because of my love. I'm pretty sure she's in love with me too, at least a little. We both try not to say this during our sex. At the moment, this love does not threaten either of our marriages. If anything, it seems that she's made Libby and Jane's marriage even stronger, but we'll both have to make sure that doesn't change. For this reason, we only meet during the day or sometimes in the evening, and only at her home. Although we have become much more daring over the past two years, we only have sex in the guest bedroom or sometimes downstairs, but never in the room or bed she shares with her husband. I understand how important this distinction is for the three of us. Likewise, although Libby cooked for me several times both before and after sex at their house, we never had dinner together in public and never spent an entire night together, let alone a weekend. At the end of the day, we are both happily married and want to stay that way. To this end, Libby never wears perfume when we meet, and I bring my own body wash and shampoo to ensure there are no foreign scents that might arouse suspicion. To further reduce the risk of discovery, 
The only gifts we give each other are items purchased with cash and used or consumed only during our love affairs. Controversially, cheating seemed to improve my own marriage. With a regular partner for good, satisfying sex, I became much less irritated and more tolerant of my wife's lack of interest. As a result, the constant background tension caused by my sexual frustration and Jane's guilt and anger was greatly reduced. And of course, on the rare occasions when we do make love, my performance has improved markedly, making the whole experience better for both of us. It's not all good news. The social price has been paid. James and I rarely communicate, and only through text messages. Although my wife still sees Libby for their book club, we are rarely invited to events that would bring the four of us together. Jane mentions this sometimes, but doesn't care too much about it. We were always a little on the periphery of their social circle. As Jane said, when this whole thing started, that was one of the reasons they thought I was the right partner in the first place. How long will this last? I just do not know. All I can say is that it's working well for all of us right now. There is no real prospect that James will ever regain this part of his bodily functions, so as long as we are careful and remain undetected, for all I know this could go on indefinitely. I have no desire to stop being Libby's lover. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click 